Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. A race against time on Capitol Hill as lawmakers unveil the second and final government funding package. What still needs to happen this week to avoid a partial shutdown. House investigators plan to call President Biden to testify in his impeachment inquiry. We have takeaways from testimony of Hunter Biden's former business associates and the White House reaction. Rising crime in Washington, D.C. How does it impact Congress and visitors? We have the highlights on what lawmakers are discussing. More student debt cancellation from the Biden administration. Another round of billions in forgiveness. Who is it for and what is the total debt cancelled now? Officials are pushing for the return of nuclear energy in Europe on a large scale. Why they're changing course now? A solution to space junk. A British company is aiming to fix this decades-long problem that's growing ever worse. Find out what their special tool is. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. And to begin the show, some breaking news. The Department of Justice and 16 states have filed an antitrust lawsuit against Apple. The long-anticipated lawsuit comes after years of allegations by critics that Apple has harmed competition. They claim it did so with restrictive App Store terms and high fees. They also claim Apple tightly controls how third-party tech companies interact with its products and services. The case is the Biden administration's latest effort to hold a big tech giant accountable under U.S. antitrust law. Apple is the only major tech giant the federal government has yet to sue since the company was named in a sprawling 2020 House report. The report found Apple, Meta, Google and Amazon hold monopoly power. And President Biden will soon be invited to testify in his own impeachment inquiry. The House panel investigating influence peddling is winding up its probe. House Oversight Chair James Comer says Americans need to hear from the president himself. He says that way President Biden can explain why his family received tens of millions of dollars from foreign companies with his assistance. Two of Hunter Biden's former business associates testified yesterday. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has takeaways from the hearing and the White House's response. Let the record show that the witness... Hunter Biden's former business associates Tony Bobulinski and Jason Galanis testified Wednesday as part of the House impeachment inquiry into President Biden. Both said Joe Biden had been involved in their past business dealings. Galanis is serving a 15-year sentence on fraud charges and testified from prison. He says the aim was to make billions using the Biden family name in foreign business dealings. He testified Hunter Biden put his then-vice president father on speakerphone with a Russian oligarch and her husband in 2014 and leveraged the family name with Chinese businessman Henry Zhao. He testified Zhao, chairman of Chinese Communist Party-linked Harvest Fund Management, was seeking partnership to gain political access in the U.S. and around the world. Galanis says prosecutors were uninterested in evidence he had of Hunter Biden's crimes and believes the reason was political. I believe I've been a victim of a pattern of retribution by the Department of Justice. I believe I'm putting myself at grave risk within the BOP for providing information on these matters concerning the president and his son. Glanis also testified he was sexually abused by a member of the prison staff at FPC Pensacola last year. He persisted in sexually harassing me for many months thereafter. I, I had hoped to receive home confinement, which would remove me from danger. Bobolinsky started off by accusing representatives Jamie Raskin and Dan Goldman of lying. We keep hearing from certain corners that our democracy is at risk and democracy is on the ballot in 24. Yet the same people preaching this mantra know better. They continue to lie directly to the American people without hesitation and remorse. He alleged Hunter Biden and James Biden had perjured themselves during deposition. Democrats called convicted businessman Lev Parnas to testify, an associate of Rudy Giuliani. I will invite President Biden. House Oversight Chair James Comer says he will invite President Biden to testify in the coming days. He's also considering ethics-related bills to target influence peddling or foreign lobbying among officials. The panel will issue a final report with recommendations once the inquiry has concluded. The White House says Republicans need to move on and focus on other issues. White House spokesman Ian Sams called it a sad stunt and told Comer to call it a day, pal. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. 
As we move closer to November, President Biden has more than double the money in the bank compared to former President Trump. Trump, meanwhile, has a slight polling advantage in swing states, which could decide November's election. In February, Biden's campaign said it raised more than $53 million, giving it a total of more than $155 million. Trump, meanwhile, raised $39 million in February, with a total of $74 million. This week, President Biden attended two private fundraising events in Texas. Trump's campaign is bogged down by legal fees. Just last month, his political action committee, Save America, spent more than $5 million on legal fees. And congressional leaders today rolled out the final $1.2 trillion funding package ahead of the Saturday shutdown deadline. The new package would boost budgets for both border and defense. Congress passed six bills earlier this month to fund some government agencies for the rest of the fiscal year. Several critical government operations need to be funded by this Friday, including the Departments of State, Defense, Homeland Security, Labor, Education, and the Legislative Branch. Under House GOP rules, leadership typically requires 72 hours for members to review bill text before a vote. In the Senate, objection from any one senator could derail a quick vote. If the government misses the deadline, it would likely have limited impact to government operations if funding were to be restored before the end of the weekend. And coming up, news details on the death of Senator Mitch McConnell's sister-in-law. Police say the shipping billionaire was intoxicated at the time of the fatal car accident. As the Biden administration increases car regulations, a statistician says more electric vehicles wouldn't affect the environment as intended. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. We all know that words have power. They set things in motion. And make us happy or sad. But there's one word that stands out because when people say it, lives are changed. It's not a big word. It's itsy bitsy. It's only three little letters. But when you say it, the life of a kid like me can be changed. So what is this special word? It may surprise you. It's yes. 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 Yes to becoming a monthly supporter of Shriners Hospitals for Children. That's right. Your monthly support allows the doctors and nurses at Shriners Hospitals for Children to give the most amazing care anywhere and change the lives of kids like me. And me. And me. Because people like you have said, yes, now I can play football. And I can play catch. And I can walk. So what do you say? Will you say yes right now? It's so easy. All you have to do is pick up the phone or go to loveshriners.org right now and say yes. When you say yes to giving just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day, we'll send you this adorable love to the rescue blanket as a reminder of all the kids you're helping every day. My life is filled with possibility because of the monthly support of people just like you who called the number on your screen and said yes. 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 Your yes is making a difference in my life and the lives of so many other kids like me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving. Please call or go online now if operators are busy, call again or go to loveshriners.org to say yes right away. Stay tuned to get two rolls of Alien Tape free. You wouldn't stick your mother-in-law on the wall, but you could with Alien Tape. It just sticks. Just peel and stick to make anything stay in place quick. Brick, pavers, marble, tile, plastic, even leather. Nothing works better than Alien Tape. You wouldn't stick your fishbowl on a moving car, but you could with Alien Tape. The secret is nano stick technology that grabs and locks on to secure one side of the surface to the other. Alien Tape secures in seconds, then twist, pull, and rinse to reuse. Call or go online to get your first roll of Alien Tape for just $19.99, plus shipping and processing. But to make this deal really stick, we'll give you two more rolls absolutely free. You get three rolls of Alien Tape for one low price. Order now. 
To order, call 1-800-490-1364 or go to tryaliantape.com. So call 1-800-490-1364 or order online at tryaliantape.com. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. The Federal Reserve isn't budging on its key interest rate, despite the nation facing the highest inflation in decades. To discuss this, we're joined by Jeffrey Tucker, senior economic columnist with the Epic Times and founder and president of the Brownstone Institute. Jeffrey, good to see you. To begin with, what's your initial response to the Fed's rate decision? And what do you think it indicates uh, about the state of the economy? Well, if I want to be blunt about it, I would say that uh, the Federal Reserve has decided it wants to reelect Biden. Uh, it, because there's no basis for for believing that we need rate cuts, much less three over the course of the year. We've had terrible inflation numbers this this year, uh, three straight months of, of increasingly bad data. And that's just the official rates. In an article for Epoch Times, I, I explained that more and more economists are looking more carefully at the way the CPI is calculated. Um, I had an article yesterday that showed that uh, Lawrence Summers, of, of formerly president of Harvard, has an article in MBER uh, that just came out last month that recalculates a 2023 inflation rate as having peaked at 18 percent. Now, that makes a lot more sense from the point of view of consumers. That seems like more or less where we were. So we're dealing with really a catastrophic inflation situation. It's not getting better. And for the Fed to be jawboning Wall Street and tempting it with a higher, with, with more money and credit right now is gravely irresponsible and risks uh, going into a hyperinflationary situation. Wow. So considering everything that you've just said uh, and what we might expect more of in the future, how can people prepare for that? Mm, that well, that's a good question. I, I mean, uh, one is, of course, to get out of uh, debt and get your finances in order. I don't know what else to do about that. I mean, it's a problem when you have the Federal Reserve engaged in what is, in effect, a, a pillaging of the public. I mean, inflation is another form of taxation. Uh, the government wins and all of its favored corporations and bond dealers, but the public loses. So you have the Fed <clears throat> here willing to risk another wave of, of high inflation uh, in exchange for which they, they're going to keep kicking the can down the road and keep the economy afloat. That's that's really what's going on here. It's as I say, it's it's unbelievably irresponsible, and it's deeply disappointing from from my point of view. I mean, Powell has been well, in effect, a terrible manager of the Fed, but you get the sense that he didn't want to be. <laughs> He's just being pressured by the Biden administration to use his powers to uh, to make the economy look pretty when actually there's a tremendous amount of decay underneath it all. And yet, so people are, are actually feeling it, though. They're not really fooled, if you could say that. You know, if the, the economy is not going so well, people know it already. Um, it, people are not being fooled. I mean, you know, you just look at prices. The, under the official data, um, we've only lost 18 cents on a dollar over four years. I mean, like, there's nobody who believes that. You know, real, real shoppers. Uh, our estimated inflation rates, you know, 20, uh, 30, 50, 100 percent on the products, everyday products that they that they buy. And if you add borrowing costs to that, uh, we have we've it's much worse last year than it was at the peak in 1979 and 1980. And that led to a political revolution. So that's exactly what they're trying to prevent right now is try to calm the public down lie with the numbers, lie with the jobs numbers, the inflation numbers, the output numbers, nothing is real anymore. <laughs> it's all just fake. And they're trying to keep people calm. But yeah, you're right. Uh, average consumers know that these numbers are not true and that things are much, much worse than what we're being told. Is there anything that the Biden administration can do? You seem to, to believe that they might be applying pressure to, on the feds, but is there anything that the yeah. administration can do to convince voters that the economy could be better under a second Biden term as compared to a second Trump term? 
Well, it, I don't know if anybody's believing anything that's coming out from the White House these days. I mean, maybe people are. It's, it's hard to tell. But, you know, they keep just claiming uh, just, just nonsense, the greatest economy ever, jobs creation all over the place. I mean, that's not true. I mean, we've for the last year, we've lost full-time jobs and only created part-time jobs. And not even for uh, Americans, American citizens. It's mostly been for migrant populations and that sort of thing. So... Um, and the output numbers are mostly being uh, manipulated by government spending, the inflation numbers, you can't believe them uh, anymore. But I don't know, you know, I, I think we've got a very, I don't know how else to put it, but a deeply cynical uh, administration that's, mm. that's, that's willing to sacrifice truth for political power. And, and you know, it's, we're now in, in March, we've got all the way to November. And that's all they're really concerned about is making it all the way to November so they can continue to claim <clears throat> this is a great economy, even while people are suffering. But, you know, we, we've, we're seeing the decay in all sorts of numbers, one of which is uh, falling credit standards, uh, credit ratings for average people. We've seen the first yeah. big downtick that we've seen in many years. And, and yeah. And, in well, credit ratings, which means people are not paying their bills. Yeah, and for some time now already, you know, the Biden administration has kind of dropped or eased off that term Bidenomics. It didn't show up in the, you know, the, by President Biden's recent speech to the nation. Um, so we can see that they're also sensing this and responding in, in some sense. But uh, thank you so much, Jeffrey. That's all we've got time for for now. But Jeffrey Tucker, senior economic columnist with the Epic Times and founder and president of the Brownstone Institute. Always great to speak with you. Pleasure. And today, lawmakers hearing testimony about crime in D.C. and hearing the hearing focuses on how the rising danger impacts visitors and congressional operations. The hearing is held by the Committee on House Administration titled Safety on Capitol Hill, D.C. Crime's Impact on Congressional Operations and Visitors. Let's listen. D.C. crime is out of control. Anyone who lives, visits, or works in D.C. has seen the impact that weak, weak on crime policies have had on public safety. In recent years, the D.C. City Council has taken a variety of steps that have weakened the city's crime laws, requiring Congress to step in. In 2020, the D.C. City Council cut $15 million from the Metropolitan Police Department budget. Simultaneously, the Council repeatedly passed temporary emergency policies that restricted police officers' authority and changed the D.C. criminal code. For the first time in 30 years, Congress had to act and nullify a D.C. law because it was so ridiculous. Crime in D.C. is so bad that President Biden was shamed into reversing his veto threat. Months later, the House and Senate had to act again. We passed another resolution to overturn the anti-police policies implemented by the D.C. City Council. Unfortunately, President Biden vetoed this bill. This was a missed opportunity, as today, D.C. crime continues to remain a problem. My hometown of Wisconsin, I hear from countless families who are concerned with crime and policies we have in place. Last spring, Wisconsin adopted a new amendment to our state constitution related to bail reform. This amendment came as concerns for public safety and crime continued to increase. The same can be said for Capitol Hill today. I hear from visitors and staff alike who share their concerns about crime in our nation's capital. Capitol Hill, specifically Ward 6, which encompasses the Capitol complex has seen an increase in violent crime in the past few years. I'd like to note for committee record that we invited Ward 6 Councilman Charles Allen to our discussion today. The committee made several attempts, but unfortunately, Mr. Allen did not answer our request to participate in today's hearing. As chairman of the Committee on House Administration, I'm committed to ensuring our nation's capital and surrounding areas safe for every American family. I think we can all agree, whether you're here for a tour of the Capitol or to meet with your representative, every visitor deserves to feel safe. Each year, the Capitol Visitor Center alone welcomes an estimated 2.5 million visitors to our nation's capital. However, in the last year, we've seen a dramatic increase in crime in Washington, D.C., particularly near the Capitol complex. Let's examine the numbers. In 2023, violent crime was up 39% year over year in our nation's capital. 
There are over 6,800 motor vehicle thefts in D.C. There were 959 carjackings. For context, there were 152 carjackings in 2019. In Ward 6 specifically, which includes the United States Capitol, there were over, there were over 150 robberies in the past six months and 350 vehicles were stolen. Last year, two of my colleagues were victims of crime. In September, I hosted a security briefing where we heard from two staff members who were mugged at gunpoint just down the street. These individuals shared their stories about the dangers of violent crime and the need to remain vigilant. Each of these statistics represents a staff member, a visitor, a member of Congress. As the Committee on House Administration, we're tasked with the oversight over the Capitol campus security. Rising crime in our nation's capital, particularly near the Capitol, has constrained resources for U.S. Capitol Police and the Sergeant at Arms. U.S. Capitol Police must devote more and more of their resources to increase threats against the Hill community. These resources may otherwise be spent on the U.S. Capitol Police's actual obligation and their core mission. As crime continues to remain a serious threat and concerns for members, staff, and visitors, I'm focusing on finding ways we can reduce violent crime in our nation's capital, in particular near the Capitol campus. Today I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses about how violent crime threatens U.S. Capitol security. We'll explore the impact of soft on crime policies, and we must discuss how we can ensure the Capitol is safe and secure for all visitors and staff. As chairman, I'm committed to making Capitol Hill a safe place to visit and to work. With that, I'll now yield the ranking member five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, for uh, convening us. Um, let me uh, begin, first of all, by offering congratulations. I know we have some new staff here, a new parliamentarian, assistant parliamentarian, deputy clerk, so I want to congratulate uh, these appointees and wish them uh, the best as they take on these new responsibilities. And I certainly want to welcome our panel. First of all, uh, always good to see uh, Chief Manger. Thank you for uh, your long service, Chairman Pemberton uh, and Mr. Uh, Manguel. We're, we're grateful for your uh, service and for being here today. I, I don't think there's a responsibility I take more seriously as the ranking member of this committee than the safety of staff, visitors, and certainly members on and around the Capitol campus. And I've said this before, I'll say it in the future, the law enforcement has our back. It's critical that we have your back as well. That includes the United States Capitol Police, uh, the Washington Metropolitan uh, Police Department, as well as federal law enforcement. Uh, agencies like the FBI and, uh, and ATF. It's no secret that in 2020, during the pandemic, homicide and violent cre crime increased across the nation. Thankfully, while there is so much more that needs to be done, um, in 2023, violent crime and homicide rates dropped significantly. And last year, saw one of the lowest rates of violent crime in the United States in more than half a century. Those aren't my uh, uh, you know, uh, observations, those are the statistics. Unfortunately, the District of Columbia has been the exception to the rule, and the congressional community has not been immune to this uptick in violence here. Members, as the chair has um, indicated, have been assaulted in elevators and carjacked, and staff have been brutally stabbed and robbed at gunpoint. So I'm pleased that the District of Columbia has taken some steps to address these issues. As I understand earlier this month, the D.C. Council passed the Secure D.C. Omnibus Amendment Act which contains about 100 provisions, increasing gun violence penalties, expanding the definition of carjacking, addressing organized retail theft, and more. I must point out, however, that this is at least the fourth hearing convened by um, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle on crime in the nation's capital of this Congress. Despite all the talk of armed robberies and shootings, I've yet to hear my colleagues meaningfully address the issue of common sense gun safety measures to keep guns out of the hands of criminals in the District of Columbia. On the contrary, the fiscal year 2024 financial services and general government funding bill includes a policy rider advanced by uh, my Republican colleagues that would permit concealed carry of firearms in the District of Columbia. It's astonishing that you would do that at a time when we're concerned about violent crime. Guns, and let's make this clear, guns make violent crime more violent 
and more deadly. And I struggle to rec reconcile my colleagues' concerns about violent crime with a complete disregard of the key driver of those crimes. There are no commercial gun stores in the District of Columbia, so the guns used here are from out of state. These guns are often acquired illegally through either straw purchasers or unlicensed sellers. Yet every single Republican on this committee who was here in last Congress voted against the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which created the first federal criminal statutes for firearms trafficking and straw purchasing. Just recently, Capitol Police officers arrested a man uh, just off Capitol grounds carrying a rifle he brought to the District of Columbia from um, the state of Georgia. Unless we take common sense steps supported by a majority of Americans, people on, um, of the American people on the question of illegal firearms, we'll never fully address or solve the violent crime issue here in Washington. That's why I've introduced the State Firearms Dealer Licensing Enforcement Act and will soon reintroduce the Gun Theft Prevention Act. These bills would crack down on gun trafficking by ensuring oversight and licensing requirements for firearm dealers and by granting ATF the tools to hold repeat offenders accountable. We also need to support the efforts of federal law enforcement partners like the FBI and ATF, who in the last few months have redoubled their efforts to track down and prosecute violent criminals in Washington, D.C. What we should not be doing at this time is to call for the defunding of the FBI and ATF. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't note the role the federal government plays in the local criminal justice system here in the District of Columbia. For example, when the Metropolitan Police reports to the city government, much of the rest of the criminal justice infrastructure is federal, which creates serious coordination issues. In a tragic example of these issues, according to the chairman of the D.C. Council, the individual who stabbed Senator Rand Paul Staffer was released by the Federal Bureau of Prisons with no notice to the District of Columbia. He was supposed to go into custody or supervision of another federal agency, the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, which apparently did not happen. So the coordination is an issue we must address. Um, I want to thank again our witnesses. I'm looking forward to your testimony and to the questions, and I uh, look forward uh, to the proceedings. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman Stile. Uh, Ranking Member Morelli and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify regarding crime and safety in and around Capitol Hill. The Department greatly appreciates the committee's continued support of the men and women of the United States Capitol Police. Congress's support has been invaluable as we continued our work in addressing law enforcement demands within our jurisdiction and the dramatic workload increases in an ever-expanding volatile threat environment throughout the country. I want to start off with a very brief video. Um, this is, is something that happened just two weeks ago. Um, a lookout was broadcast uh, for a robbery that occurred at the CVS on I Street Southeast. And um, you, what you're going to see is it catches a suspect as, um, as he runs, um, uh, flees the scene. And um, I want to show you what happens next. So you'll see here in a moment there's a, a black SUV that comes down the street and stops. Uh, there it is right there, and it's going to stop on the corner. These, uh, uh, and you see two women jump out of the SUV and, because they have seen the suspect fleeing down the street. And the one intercepts him, the other one tackles him. Wow. Then you see the driver of the SUV, a, a male, help uh, bring this suspect down, the, and the fourth suspect, or the fourth individual, uh, came out of the uh, back passenger seat. Uh, all four of those individuals were um, Capitol Police officers. Uh, the first one who intercepted him, uh, the tall woman, was uh, Deputy Chief Janita Mitchell, um, and the Inspector uh, Carnesha Mendoza tackled him. Um, Dave Millard and uh, Sergeant Angela Singletary assisted with uh, getting him into custody. This is just an example of the almost daily interaction that the USCP has with our law enforcement partners in the National Capital Region. Next, the shipping industry CEO Angela Chow was intoxicated when she drove into a pond and died last month in Texas. That's in a sheriff's report released yesterday. The sheriff's office says Chow's blood alcohol level was nearly three times the state's legal limit and called her death an unfortunate accident. Chow was sister-in-law to Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. She died after having dinner with a large group at a ranch west of Austin. 
The report describes a frantic scene as friends and deputies try to pull Chow from her Tesla after she backed it into a pond on the property. It says Chow called her friend to say she was trapped inside her car in the water. The conversation lasted eight minutes as the car slowly sank. Emergency crews pulled Chow out of the car and brought her to shore where she was pronounced dead. She's survived by her husband, father, and four sisters. If every gas-powered car gets replaced with an electric vehicle, would global temperatures actually go down? The Biden administration and EPA recently released stricter regulation on automakers. It's part of Biden's climate agenda, and it would force car makers to expand electric options in their lineup even more quickly. For insight, I spoke with Kevin Dayaratna, chief statistician at Heritage Foundation's Center for Data Analysis. Kevin, welcome and thanks for being with us. Now tell us about this rule and how it would affect people. Uh, thank you for having me. Yes, so the, the tailpipe rule that was just issued by the Biden administration is intended to curb greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector for the purpose of averting climate change. And it's interesting because it is um, going to require uh, people to purchase more expensive cars. Quite frankly, automakers are not going to be able to meet these requirements. And, second, and secondly, it's not even going to um, meaningfully avert climate change. Um, the impacts we've computed at the Heritage Foundation are quite trivial. You're saying um, this, is, this wouldn't be effective in regulating and reducing pollution for the, for the world? Well, the government has a very clever trick up its sleeve when it proposes rules like this. The idea is they talk about reductions in CO2. So when they say we're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by over 50 percent, which is what this rule intends to do, over 50 percent from the transportation sector or more, the, the idea is that people, they, they think people will believe that this is, wow, huge reductions in GHG emissions. They always fail miserably to go the next step ahead and compute the actual temperature impact. And when you do that, like I said, the impact is trivial. Now, in terms of costs for people that are in the market to buy cars, um, what would this do to automobiles and electric vehicles? Yeah, that's a great question. So EVs, as everyone knows, are more expensive. And there are all these talking points that go back and forth regarding, yes, EVs are more expensive, but then over the lifetime of the car, they can be less expensive. So it might be a little bit more expensive in the long run, but not so much. But what these studies fail to account or these supposed cost benefits fail to account for is that the electric vehicle industry is heavily subsidized. Um, and there's a study that was put out by the Texas Public Policy Foundation that found that um, over a 10-year time horizon, EVs are on average subsidized by about over $50,000. Um, so a tremendous amount of government involvement goes into subsidizing these vehicles. And again, the, the purpose is climate change. But like I said, these policies are going to have no impact. Just to reiterate, again, by the end of the century, these policies will have no more than 0 0.07 degrees Celsius temperature mitigation. How do people feel about electric vehicles in the market? I mean, there's a significant amount of heterogeneity regarding you know, consumer behavior regarding um, electric vehicles and their and how they feel about them. Uh, again, some people like EVs, and you know we have nothing against EVs in particular. I mean, people should be allowed to buy EVs, but people should be able and allowed to buy the vehicle of their choice. Um, EVs are more expensive, and they're not necessarily the best fit for everybody. They don't really do too well in cold weather, in cold climates, for example, um, and as well as extremely warm climates. So again, the question is, people should be allowed to purchase a vehicle that is to their liking and best for them. And these government mandates don't get us there. All right, Kevin, thank you so much for your analysis and insight. We're glad to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Coming up, House Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan launches an investigation into the IRS. The lawmaker suggests the agency is using artificial... ...in here. Yeah, it can. And it might. These people, they're not interested in the facts. They're not interested in anything except crushing people that are in their way. There needs to be a formal deprogramming of the cult members. A strong church can stop this. Tangazo hili linahusu njaa. Tarajia kuona watoto wakiwa na njaa katika maeneo haya. 
Mambo yalikuwa bora kwa miaka mingi tuliweza kupigana na njaa na watoto wachache walikufa. Lakini sasa mambo yamebadilika na kwa mabaya zaidi. Hii ni kwa sababu wakati huu hukame umeangamiza zaidi. Через війни та конфлікти ми мусимо залишати наші домівки і всі наші речі. Ми навіть не маємо їжі. Тому нам потрібна ваша допомога. Millions of children are fighting to survive due to inequality, conflict, poverty, and the climate crisis. Save the Children is working alongside communities to provide a better life for children. And there's a way you can help. Please call or go online to give just $10 a month only 33 cents a day. We urgently need 1,000 new monthly donors in the next 30 days to help the children we support around the world. You can help provide food, medicine, care, and protection, plus so much more that a child needs by calling right now and giving just $10 a month. Ви можете допомогти голодуючим родинам вижити. Орбочоку буксе мене сирок сотиге. All we need are 1,000 monthly donors in the next 30 days. Please call or go online now with your monthly gift of just $10. Thanks to generous government grants, every dollar you give can have up to 10 times the impact. And when you call with your credit card, we will send you this Save the Children tote bag as a thank you for your support. Your small monthly donation of just $10 could be the reason a child in crisis survives. Please call or go online to hungerstopsnow.org to help save lives today. Losing the fear of looking foolish comes with age. Who did you steal him from? Losing your way in your own home doesn't. Confusion with time and place may be a sign of Alzheimer's. Mom, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Early detection gives you and your loved one time to plan for the future. Learn the warning signs of Alzheimer's. The IRS may be using artificial intelligence to spy on Americans. House Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan is launching an investigation into the concern. The Ohio congressman and fellow Republican Harriet Hageman sent letters to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and Attorney General Merrick Garland informing them of the probe. The IRS said in a September 2023 press release that it would be employing AI to crack down on tax evasion. Jordan and Hageman pointed to a report from James O'Keefe's O'Keefe Media Group. According to the report, the IRS is also using AI to surveil citizens' bank accounts, quote, en masse and without legal process. And joining us now is NTD Business host Don Ma to give us the latest updates from the tech and business world. Don. Don, thanks for joining us. Yep. So what do you have for us today? Okay, so I, I wanted to talk to you guys about two things here. Uh, one of them is Biden uh, apparently canceling more student loan debt. And besides that, I know earlier you had a discussion on the Federal Reserve and interest rates. Uh, so I wanted to add a little bit to that discussion on why interest rate cuts are, are so desired right now. So let me start off with the uh, cancellation. So President Joe Biden announced today that uh, he's canceling another six billion dollars nearly anyways of student loans so the student loans would be canceled for around 78,000 borrowers uh, and these borrowers are those including uh, public service workers uh, like teachers nurses firefighters and this group of people are eligible for student debt cancellation after making 10 years of monthly payments so of course biden is seeking re-election in november and he does need the youth vote to help him win. Uh, so let's keep that in mind. The, a White House official said that uh, Biden's latest move brought the total amount of debt cancellation under this administration to over $140 billion in outstanding loans. And this is according to the federal student aid, aid website. And higher education debt uh, in the U.S. has tripled uh, actually in, in, in the U.S. since the 2008 financial crisis. And, and additionally, 380,000 borrowers who may be eligible for debt relief within the next one or two years will also be getting emails from President Biden. Uh, and it's going to say, 
keep it up. Right. Okay. Uh, I mean, these are interesting times in terms of it is an election year, so we'll, we'll see how that could impact things as well. But um, you mentioned you want to talk to us about interest rates. Right. So, I mean, this is a, a perfect uh, setup because we're talking about student loans, right? This is the perfect backdrop to talk about interest rates. So, of course, we all know the Federal Reserve uh, made their decision yesterday, and I'll just give some quick context uh, to that, which is relevant to our discussion. So the Federal Reserve uh, kept uh, interest rates steady yesterday, meaning no cuts and as well as no hikes as well to the interest rate. So uh, in terms of cuts, uh, Powell actually said yesterday that it is his instinct that rates will not go back down to the very low levels like before the pandemic. And he says there's tremendous uncertainty actually about where the long term rate will ultimately stand. Uh, so nevertheless, uh, Fed policymakers indicated they still expect to reduce uh, rates three times by, by the end of 2024. And so that brings us to why rates are so rate cuts are so anticipated. Uh, so over time, the, the rate cuts will lead to lower costs for anything related to credit. So of course, that includes student debt, but as well as to home loans, auto loans, credit card borrowing costs, and business loans as, as well. It also creates an easier financial environment for companies. Uh, and that means higher profit margins and the stock market would benefit as well. Uh, think about your 401ks. Um, so, you know, all these benefits added together uh, is why a lot of people are looking forward to rate cuts right now. Mm. Yeah, I could see that with the economy and prices going up. Definitely people could use every you know, type of benefit that they can. So Don Ma, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. $8.5 billion going to chip maker Intel from the federal government. President Biden announced the grants while campaigning in Arizona yesterday. It's one of the biggest investments in U.S. semiconductor manufacturing from the federal government. Here's the story. The funding for Intel projects in Arizona and three other states will come from the Chips and Science Act passed in 2022. The law aims to boost domestic manufacturing of semiconductor chips and reduce America's dependence on Asia for cutting-edge chips. The White House said the money will go towards supporting construction, expansion, and modernization of Intel facilities in Arizona, Ohio, New Mexico, and Oregon. Speaking in Chandler, Arizona, Biden said this will create thousands of new jobs. Today's investment helps all Americans in red states and blue states all across America, urban, rural, suburban, and tribal communities. The president spoke about his efforts to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. while taking a swipe at former President Trump. On his watch, companies sent American jobs overseas for cheaper labor and imported products. We're creating jobs in America and exporting American products. But there could be concerns as the money starts flowing later this year. Chip manufacturing is a water-intensive activity. It takes a lot of water to cool down machinery and rinse silicon. Water that in Arizona is a scarce commodity. An S&P Global Ratings report placed water scarcity as a risk in the coming decade for the tech hardware industry. Intel also says they are facing several delays. In Ohio, the company said they would not be able to meet their 2025 goal of completing two new chip plants, and said they wouldn't be until 2027 or 2028. And now we have some short headlines from Belgium and other European countries. American and European officials today advocating for nuclear energy in Europe. They're meeting at a summit in Brussels seeking to rebuild the European industry after years of gradual decline. Nuclear energy is a low carbon source. The political push to expand nuclear is part of Europe's drive to hit climate targets. White House climate advisor John Podesta spoke on the issue at the summit today. Expansion of nuclear power is critical for uh, tackling the climate crisis that is really beginning to uh, disturb virtually everyone across the globe. The European Union committed to cut net greenhouse gas emissions by over 50% by 2030. This has renewed the interest in nuclear power. Another reason is that Europe wants to find alternatives to Russian gas following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. But the push toward nuclear faces problems such as a lack of investment and cost overruns and delays in recent projects. The Russian, the Russian Election Commission says President Putin secured a fifth term with an overwhelming number of votes. The commission today said Putin got over 87% of the vote. 
More than 76 million voters reportedly cast their ballots for Putin, which is his highest vote tally ever. Russian officials also say that voter turnout was the highest ever in modern-day Russia, with over 77 percent turnout. Officials say they didn't receive a single complaint regarding the election results. But numerous incidents made headlines during the voting weekend, such as a voter pouring paint over the ballot boxes as a form of protest. The U.S. State Department said Tuesday that Russia's election occurred under intense repression of independent voices. Europe is moving closer to using Russian money to buy weapons for Ukraine. The Prime Minister of Belgium today welcomed the proposal from the European Union. Around 70% of all Russian assets in the West are held in a Belgian securities depository. Here's what the Prime Minister says about the idea. The proposal and the proceeds themselves, I think it's a sensible way of, uh, of doing it. I think the idea to allocate it predominantly to the purchase of weapons makes total, uh, makes total sense. The EU wants to use the profits from the Russian assets held in Europe, not the assets themselves. The bloc expects this could bring around $3 billion annually. And in related news, Russia conducted its first attack on Ukra Ukraine's capital in six weeks. Moscow allegedly fired 31 missiles at Kyiv today. Officials say air defenses shot down all the incoming missiles, but added that 13 people, including a child, were injured by falling wreckage. Coming up with spring in the air, it's the right time for all kinds of traditional Easter-themed treats. We'll have more on London's colorful cupcakes shortly here on NTD News Today. Presenting the heritage of traditional Chinese martial arts, fostering martial ethics, and reviving the true tradition. The preliminaries for the 2024 NTD International Traditional Martial Arts Competition will be held across New York, Taiwan, and Germany. The Grand Finals will be broadcast live online worldwide in August 2024. For more information, please call 1-888-477-9228. My name's Jen Marshall. I've been playing professional football in a women's league for three years now. We're about three and a half weeks out of my second surgery now. I had no pain whatsoever, no tingling, no numbness, and I felt incredible. I'm able to do pretty much anything. He doesn't want me pushing it too much, but I'm able to do, you know, assisted pull-ups now. I'm riding a bike. I'm walking continuously at an incline on treadmills. I can do push-ups again. I can get out of bed, no problem. You're in great hands. Visit askbenati.com. Did you know the government can essentially rob you in plain sight? Former Fed Chair Alan Greenspan warned, deficit spending is simply a scheme for the confiscation of wealth. But he added, gold stands in the way of this insidious process. Birch Gold Group has helped thousands of Americans diversify their IRA or 401k into gold. To get a free info kit from Birch Gold, text PREPARE to 989898. Again, text PREPARE to 989898 right now. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I'm here to tell you about my new product from my pillow. Towels that actually work. Watch this absorbency test. Here's another towel that we randomly went out and bought. Here's one of my towels with a nice design. I don't know if you can see this, but you could line a swimming pool with this. I mean, this is crazy. Get rid of it. Towels that actually work. What a concept. I'm interrupting this commercial to let you know you can get our six piece My Towels, regular $69.98, now only $29.98. Or you can save 25% on our brand new kitchen towels made with the same technology as our famous My Towels. Also, we have bath sheets, bath towels, washcloths, hand towels, and so much more. And the best part, with your promo code, your entire order ships absolutely free. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use that promo code to get deep discounts on all my towels. And for a limited time, your order ships absolutely free. When I was growing up, my mom was extremely tidy. We grew up and to see this transition was very alarming. When Sean talked to me, it was a wake up call, and that's when I went to the doctor. Trash floating around the Earth's orbit is a growing problem. 
A new company called Astroscale has a solution to catch old satellites and other space junk. Let's take a look at what may be the future of space trash removal. The UK company aims to solve a decades-long problem that's getting worse. At stake are billions of dollars in assets. This includes orbital devices crucial to navigation and smartphone maps, text messaging, calls, and internet connections used by people globally. Space debris is, is a big problem for all of us on, on, on Earth. Basically, since the start of the space age in 1957, we've had a throwaway culture in space. We've put lots of objects in space, and we've basically not removed them. We've not recycled them or done anything else. The sheer size of the problem is quite surprising. So there's 10,000 tons of debris in space, you know, near 40,000 objects, all floating around in different orbits. The possible dangers to people in orbit is even more concerning. Another big risk is human risk. We have quite a few yes, uh, astronauts in orbit now. There's going to be more commercial space stations planned over the next few years. How does the process of removing space junk work? We're using a robot arm to capture the space object in question and then bring it close and then bring it down to a lower orbit and then release it so it can burn up in the atmosphere. And we've removed that debris object then. Nick Shave expects the technology to be ready to go in two or three years. Astroscale is also looking at refueling satellites while they're still in space. Now, when a satellite runs out of fuel, its mission is over. But the company is trying to change that with the Cosmic Servicer spacecraft project. It would be able to refuel satellites and give them a new lease on life. Back on Earth, Colorful Easter-themed cupcakes and traditional hot cross buns are in season. London bakers are busy preparing freshly baked treats ahead of Easter. But the cost of core ingredients just keeps going up, and the expense of chocolate, sugar and eggs are having an impact on business. From cupcakes decorated with chicks, eggs and bunny ears to colorful spring cakes, this bakery in London's Primrose Hill is awash with the bright colors of spring. The founder of the bakery said she thinks everyone likes to have some treats. I think everyone really feels like they need kind of treats at the moment. The, the weather, the rain, the winter has gone on forever and ever. We're in a big cost of living crisis. Um, it's not much fun for a lot of people at the moment. So I wanted to create sort of a place where you can come into the shop or you can order and have delivery and it be comforting and fun and, you know, Easter is a fun time. She said the prices of core ingredients like chocolate, sugar and butter have doubled, if not tripled, over the last year. And it's hard, I don't want to pass on all the full increase to the customer because I'm trying to, you know, want it to be a neighbourhood business and, and make it affordable for everyone to come in not you know it should be okay for anyone to come in have a cupcake or a biscuit or anything and it's hard the price rises have made it very very difficult on the other side of london at comptoir bakery in bermondsey preps are underway to bake and prepare hot cross buns traditionally eaten on good friday to mark the end of lent the sweet buns are now enjoyed all year round but are especially sought after during the Easter period. Uh, we just tweak the recipe a little bit. We add all the spices, mixed spice, nutmeg, cinnamon, you name it. We have a lot. And then we have the fruits, raisin, currants, and mixed peel, orange and lemon. And that's what gives you the flavor. The humble hot cross bun is usually a more affordable option. But this ancient traditional treat is also feeling the weight of global price increases. Unfortunately, we had to uh, increase the price as well for the customer. But I think people understand. Uh, now it's been, it's been hard for the last uh, two years, three years, I will say. Um, it's getting a bit better, but not yet. So we've got to be careful, I mean, um, in, in order to survive. Life is short, eat the cake, the sign reads. With spring in the air, the bakers are confident they'll have a busy Easter season. On this episode of Strong Mind and Body, we're going to look at the mental health benefits of living a simpler life. Here's Gina Marie.
many of us are driven by a desire to never be bored and to do more and achieve more. This is an exciting way to live, but it comes at a price. A never-ending quest to have it all can take its toll on your mental health. Let's look at the benefits of living a simpler life, starting with number one, less decision fatigue. In 2008, a team of researchers performed four studies. They measured the effects of decision fatigue on human self-control. You probably won't be surprised to hear what they learned. The more decisions a person had to make, the less self-control they displayed afterward. Hmm. A simpler life naturally means fewer choices to make and more mental space for everything else. Number hmm. two, a greater focus on relationships. A happy and meaningful life is filled with good relationships, and yet somehow we can't seem to leave unrushed time to nurture these relationships. It's as if we expect things to just take care of themselves. Intentionally leading a simple life is the best way to create time for relationships. Number three, a calmer physical environment. An unusual study was conducted in 2010. The way people describe their homes in a walking tour correlated with measurable stress levels. People who described their homes as disorganized or cluttered had cortisol profiles associated with oh. adverse health outcomes. Wow. Number four, freedom from digital distractions. If you've ever taken an extended break from your smartphone, you know the feeling of calm this can bring. For many, their smartphone is an unhealthy addiction and a major distraction from long-term goals. Aim to have phone-free time daily. This will allow emotional freedom to dream bigger dreams. Number five, time for passion projects. Some of our happiest experiences in life come when we lose ourselves in personally meaningful work. When we remove distractions, we have more time to pursue projects for their own sake. And number six, discovering the power of less. If there's one thing you can learn from a minimalist lifestyle, it's that less truly can be more. In the real world, chasing everything leads to stress, scattered attention, and abandoned projects. In closing, the road to simplicity is one in which you choose to focus on fewer things, but do them well. For round the clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world. I didn't ask to lose my mother or to be abused at five years old. I didn't ask to be kicked out of my house with nowhere to go. I didn't ask for any of this. But I did ask for help, and Covenant House was there. Thanks to their love and support, and to generous people like you, I got what I needed to take control of my life. For the young people who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations, Covenant House is there providing safety, hope, and a brighter future. Call or go online now for a gift of only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day. You can provide hot meals, safe shelter, medical care, and love to more than 2,000 young people who sleep at a Covenant house every night. One in 10 young adults will experience homelessness this year. Your gift can help reach them when they need it most. I didn't ask for my parents and my family to disown me. I didn't ask to end up in a homeless shelter. The beauty of it all is, is that I found Covenant House. The need is overwhelming, but your monthly support will make sure no young person is ever turned away. Call or go online right now to safeplacetosleep.org with your gift of just $19 a month. With your monthly donation, you'll receive this soft, comforting blanket as a reminder of the warmth and safety your gift will provide a young person tonight. Covenant House really helped me and really helped mold me into the woman I am today. If there's no help, Covenant House, where would I be today? Your monthly gift is urgently needed to reach young people in communities like yours who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations. Show them they're loved and not alone. Call the number on your screen or go online to safeplacetosleep.org. If you're buzzed and doing this, To make yourself feel okay to drive? ZWX. Ah. You're not okay to drive. 
Y, G, K, L, V, W, uh, regular U. These are all farmers. Maybe no, not this not one. No, a farm anymore. But here is a farm, right? No, it's also not a farm anymore. All these people shut down because of the government policies? Yeah. The government wants to control the food. So we don't eat meat, but we eat insects. As the price of staples goes through the roof, people will say, I can't afford a steak anymore. So, all right, I'll, just, I'll eat your stupid crickets. Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are our top stories. Mexico doesn't want to take back illegal immigrants from Texas. What the country's president now says about a controversial immigration law from Texas. An election official in Milwaukee found guilty in a case involving fake absentee ballots. Her explanation and more on the case. Are airlines unfairly or deceptively monetizing passenger data? The Department of Transportation aims to find out. More on their probe. Researchers are calling for U.S. officials to stop companies from aiding forced organ harvesting in China. We hear how Western technology plays a role. March Madness begins today as the NCAA tournament kicks off. NTD's Dave Martin joins us to discuss what to watch for. The annual World Happiness Report says young Americans are unhappy. Spring breakers in Miami Beach help explain why. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. And to begin the show, we have some breaking news. The Department of Justice in 15 states have filed an antitrust lawsuit against Apple. The Department of Justice, joined by 15 states and the District of Columbia, sued Apple in the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey for violating Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The long-anticipated lawsuit comes after years of allegations by critics that Apple has harmed competition. They claim it did so with restrictive App Store terms and high fees. They also claim Apple tightly controls how third-party tech companies interact with its products and services. The case is the Biden administration's latest effort to hold a big tech giant accountable under U.S. antitrust law. Apple is the only major tech giant the federal government has yet to sue since the company was named in a sprawling 2020 House report. The report found Apple, Meta, Google and Amazon hold monopoly power. And a major charter bus company has agreed to stop busing illegal immigrants to the New York City area until a civil lawsuit is concluded. Roadrunner Charters was one of the bus companies that took part in Texas Governor Greg Abbott's strategy to send illegal immigrants to sanctuary cities. New York City filed a civil lawsuit against 17 bus companies in December, seeking to recoup money spent providing housing and care to the illegal immigrants. The suit asked for over $700 million total from all the bus companies. As of December last year, Texas sent more than 33,000 illegal immigrants to New York City since the spring of 2022. That's according to the New York City Mayor's Office. Mexico won't accept anyone deported from Texas. Mexico's president made the announcement yesterday as U.S. courts keep reversing decisions regarding the controversial Texas law. The Texas law would let state authorities arrest and deport illegal immigrants. Texas lawmakers say it's needed, as the federal government, they say, isn't doing its job. President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador calls it unfair and inhumane. He claims the bill violates human rights. If Texas intends to do deportations, which is not up to them, let me say this once and for all. We will not accept deportations from the Texan government. We will not stand idly by. Obrador's statement on Wednesday came as a U.S. appeals court heard arguments over whether to temporarily allow the law or not. The U.S. Supreme Court gave the case back to the appeals court on Tuesday. The law is currently temporarily halted until the lower court makes a decision. 
Critics of the law argue that immigration has always been the job of the federal government, not individual states. And supporters of the law say it's needed to secure the southern border. Dozens of Texas sheriffs met in Austin yesterday to show support for Governor Greg Abbott and Senate Bill 4. It's everybody's problem. The gang members, the drugs, the human trafficking is coming up all through the states. It's not just stopping on the border. So it's all of our problem. We're not going to be targeting minorities or anything like that. Uh, we have to have reason to believe somebody is here illegally or has committed a crime before we will act. Under the law, Texas authorities could arrest illegal immigrants for trespassing, and state judges could order the deportation of those individuals. The suspects can then agree to the judge's order to leave the U.S. or face prosecution. First-time offenders would face a Class B state misdemeanor, which carries a punishment of up to six months in jail. Repeat offenders could face a second-degree felony and a potential prison sentence of 2 to 20 years. Joining us live to discuss the disputed Texas border law is Jessica Vaughn, Director of Policy Studies at the Center for Immigration Studies. Welcome, Jessica. Could you lay out the arguments on both sides to begin with? Because it seems like different judges are coming to different conclusions. Yes, uh, it's like watching a ping pong match uh, because we, you know, we keep getting these quick uh, rulings to reverse the prior ruling. But the basic argument is this, Texas is extremely frustrated at the Biden administration's policies to allow more than 85% of people who have crossed the border illegally to cross and remain. And so they have tried to take steps to block the flow. They're also concerned about the huge number of people who are crossing and not getting encountered by the Border Patrol. Um, and this group includes many criminals and prior deportees, and we know some terrorists also. Um, so they're frustrated with this massive influx, the, the worst in our history, and are looking for things that they can do under state law to try to deter this illegal migration. Yeah. So they pa the legislature passed this law saying that state law enforcement agencies could effectively um, in make arrests for people who crossed illegally and that state judges could order people to go back to Mexico or be imprisoned on charges of I illegal crossing. Well, the uh, a, a group of advocacy organizations, like including the ACLU and some others, and the Biden administration, have sued um, to uh, to get the federal courts to prevent this law from going into effect. And their argument is that it usurps federal sovereignty and uh, jurisdiction over immigration laws. And and they have a point. Um, traditionally, under our constitution immigration matters have been handled by the federal government. But states are very, very frustrated, and not just Texas, but all the border states and all the, the, um, the cities and states where the illegal migrants have gone to. Yeah, spreading because, quite uh, far those now. those sanctuary states mm -hmm. end up supporting these migrants. So mm -hmm. everyone is very frustrated, and we need the courts to resolve who can do what. And so, Jessica, you mentioned all the various states. So we're just looking at some of the border states, um, Texas, Arizona, and California, for example. They, they're dealing with this crisis in their own way. What have you seen of the differences between the way they, ways they're dealing with it? Well, uh, Texas is the only state that has actually attempted to put up barriers to illegal crossing and to authorize state law enforcement agencies, uh, the Department of Public Safety in Texas, to repel or arrest migrants. Um, the state of Arizona has uh, done a little bit to try to secure the land border, but, but they were enjoined by a federal court and so they stopped. In California, nothing has been done, although the San Diego County is very frustrated and making a lot of noise about the problems this is causing in the San Diego area. Um, some other states that are not on the border, like Florida is the best example, they are trying other um, um, uh, strategies to try to deter illegal migrants from even coming to their state. And you saw in the uh, story just a minute ago 
that the mayor of New York is trying to prevent the bus companies from accepting contracts to bring these migrants to New York. So every everyone is yeah. trying different things. Um, so far, the Biden administration has um, chosen not to change the policies. Uh, they want this to continue, apparently. Right. Um, but everyone is struggling with um, not only the arrival of all these people, but the cost of this and some of the crime problems that have resulted by this huge number of people uh, who are arriving here who, you know, we have yeah. no idea of their background or why they're here. And it turns out some of them are here to commit crimes. And certainly even just from seeing the Biden administration fight this law in Texas, as you mentioned, it looks like they are wanting to hold on to the status quo in terms of the way that they deal with the border crisis. Just briefly, uh, in fact, that's all we have time for, Jessica. Thank you so much, though. Jessica Vaughn, Director of Policy Studies at the Center for Immigration Studies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Zooming in on former President Trump's legal cases, the Trump campaign is asking for donations to pay a bond in the New York civil fraud case. The Trump campaign sent a message to supporters. He's calling on them to, in his words, chip in and stay in, stop the witch hunt against President Trump. The message says Trump is at risk of losing his New York properties to State Attorney General Letitia James, who brought the case. The message links donors to the Joint Fundraising Committee, where Trump typically asks supporters to contribute. Trump must pay $454 million out of his own pocket or post a bond to stave off the state's seizure of his property. And turning to a former Milwaukee election official who obtained fake absentee ballots. Kimberly Zapata is now found guilty. The jury yesterday returned a guilty verdict for one felony count of misconduct in public office and three misdemeanor counts of election fraud. Zapata could spend up to five years in prison when she's sentenced in May. The former election official argued she was trying to expose weak points in the state's election system and demonstrate how easy it was to get fake ballots. She worked as deputy director at the Milwaukee Election Commission in October 2022. She allegedly used her work computer to get a hold of three military absentee ballots using fake names and social security numbers. And over in Alabama, Governor Kay Ivey officially signed a new law that strictly punishes ballot harvesting. Ballot harvesting is when groups or organizations collect and turn in completed election ballots for voters. The law makes it a Class C felony to get money or a gift for handling someone else's absentee ballot application. And it's now punishable by up to 10 years behind bars in Alabama. Paying another person or group to pre-fill or handle an absentee ballot application is now a Class B felony with up to 20 years in prison possible. There are exceptions for people who are disabled, blind or unable to read or write, as well as overseas military personnel. Senator Joe Manchin says from now on he'll vote against judicial nominees if they don't have some bipartisan support. Manchin voted against several judicial nominees this week. The West Virginia Democrat is set to retire at the end of the year. In an interview Wednesday, he said he will only vote for nominees who have the support of at least one Republican senator. He says if a candidate is halfway decent, they'll get at least one Republican vote. The independent-minded Manchin is a critical swing vote in the closely divided Senate. He says this is his way of practicing bipartisanship, something he views as essential in Congress. Up ahead, are airlines unfairly or deceptively monetizing passenger data? The Department of Transportation aims to find out. More on their probe just after this break. Alabama is putting the brakes on diversity, equity and inclusion programs in public schools. Hear about the new law and why the governor opposes DEI. Water, nature's ultimate cleaner. We drink it, we bathe in it. Think water, think steam, think clean. Now harness the power of water with the H2OX55-in-1 steam cleaning system. 
I'm so impressed with the X5. It's an all-in-one product. I can use it throughout my entire house. It's cleaning, it's sanitizing. There's no chemicals in it. It's just steam. This is unbelievable. There is no more odor. You could spend over $500 to purchase the products that the X5 5-in-1 Miracle replaces. Order your H2O X5 steam cleaning system, a $500 value for just four easy payments of $43. Order now and we'll upgrade your X5 package. We'll add a sixth of with a dusting and polishing wand. Valued at over $30, this extra bonus attachment makes your H2O X5 the H2O X6. That means your 10-piece system becomes a 12-piece system at no extra cost to you. All for just three easy payments of $43. Call or click right now. A performance that truly matters. For each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. Shen Hyun. Coming to Lincoln Center, April 3rd through the 14th. Buy tickets now at ShenYun.com. Does shopping for bladder control products have you feeling like you need someone to be on the lookout for you? Now you have your privacy back. We're HDIS, and we home deliver bladder control products directly to you. We're always on the lookout for you. You get free shipping in plain, unmarked boxes. So your private matters, stay private. We understand how you feel. For over 35 years, we've delivered bladder control products to millions of Americans, just like you. You don't have to worry about incontinence any longer. Call now for your free product sample pack and over $45 in money-saving coupons. At HDIS, we're always in stock. We carry all brands in hundreds of styles and sizes. You'll be sure to get what you need, guaranteed. For your free sample pack with your free catalog and $45 in money-saving coupons and free product samples, call 800-701-6159. That's 800-701-6159. Hillsdale College is reaching and teaching millions of Americans to pursue truth and defend liberty. But to do that in an even bigger way, we need your help. Your generous support helps educate students from kindergarten to college, all while refusing every penny of government funding, even indirect funding like student loans or grants. And your dedicated giving allows us to teach millions of Americans through our free online courses. You make all the difference. Give a gift today. Just use this link. The House has adopted the first two measures in a six-bill package that they say will restore the energy dominance of the U.S. Lawmakers yesterday passed a proposal to ban presidents from imposing moratoriums on fracking without congressional approval. They also approved a measure to block oil and gas regulations and royalty rate hikes on federal public lands. Those are part of 2021's Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and 2022's Inflation Reduction Act. Lawmakers say the moves will roll back what President Biden calls his green energy policies. Republicans blame such policies for increasing energy costs and benefiting adversaries, including the Chinese Communist Party, Russia and Iran. The IRS may be using artificial intelligence to spy on Americans. House Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan is launching an investigation into the concern. The Ohio congressman and fellow Republican Harriet Hageman sent letters to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and Attorney General Merrick Garland informing them of the probe. The IRS said in a September 2023 press release that it would be employing AI to crack down on tax evasion. Jordan and Hageman pointed to a report from James O'Keefe's O'Keefe Media Group. The legislators wrote that according to the report, the IRS is also using AI to surveil citizens' bank accounts en masse and without legal process. The Department of Transportation is making sure airlines handle passenger information correctly. The agency will check the procedures at the 10 largest U.S. airlines. It will also examine if airlines unfairly or deceptively monetize passenger data or share it with third parties. The department says it could open formal investigations and take enforcement action if it finds any issues. Industry group Airlines for America says carriers take customer information security seriously. The group said air carriers have robust policies and cybersecurity systems to protect consumer privacy. 
An Alabama governor, Kay Ivey, signed into law yesterday a ban on diversity, equity and inclusion programs in public schools. The bill bans public schools from having DEI offices or teaching what it calls divisive concepts about race and identity. One such divisive concept would be holding people of one race responsible for actions committed by the same racial group in the past. The law also requires universities to designate bathrooms as only for males or females. Governor Ivey says her administration values Alabama's rich diversity, but won't allow what she called a few bad actors to push a liberal political movement using taxpayer funds. And staying in Alabama, lawmakers advanced legislation yesterday concerning LGBT activities in public schools. Teacher-led discussions on sexual orientation and gender identity and displaying pride flags in classrooms would be banned under the measure. Alabama's law currently limits instruction and teacher-led discussions on gender identity or sexual orientation from kindergarten through fifth grade. The law says it must be developmentally appropriate. The new bill would expand the prohibition to all K-12 grades and drop the developmentally appropriate part to make the prohibition absolute. The Chinese Communist Party's forced organ harvesting of innocent civilians. That was the topic of a panel discussion yesterday on Capitol Hill. This as Utah became the latest state to outlaw insurance coverage for organ transplant surgeries in China and other countries known for forced organ harvesting. NTD's Jack Bradley has a story. Addressing the Chinese Communist Party's forced organ harvesting of Chinese people. The Congressional Executive Commission on China addressing one of China's darkest secrets, the non-consensual forced organ harvesting of religious believers like practitioners of Falun Gong. We continue to build the case against the Chinese Communist Party uh, that they are exploiting young men and women, average age 28, thousands of them every single year who are killed to get their organs. Uh, many are Falun Gong practitioners, Uyghurs, other political and religious prisoners. This is horrifying, and it should horrify anyone, whether you're here in the United States or back in China. It is truly the wholesale rounding up of individuals of a persecuted class so that they can make, as we heard today, potentially millions of dollars off of organs harvested. The panel discussed how the Chinese regime's forced organ harvesting was specifically designed to suppress Falun Gong. Falun Gong, or Falun Dafa, is a spiritual practice based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. In 1999, there were reportedly 100 million people practicing in China, a number that surpasses the membership of the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese regime launched its persecution that year and targeted Falun Gong practitioners for organ harvesting because they maintain a healthy lifestyle and don't drink or smoke. What you have is this massive transplant infrastructure hand in hand with the incarceration of Falun Gong, which is almost two million at one point, very briefly in 2001. And then it kind of slows down to about a million to half a million at any given time. In every province in China, you see a transplant hospital go up. Every single one. Probably lots of Americans are desperate because their waiting period is so long in the, in the United States for the organs uh, to receive. Um, but going to China, you just have to think of it, you know. Um, somebody will be killed on demand. We can't do anything about the supply of stolen organs, but what we can do is choke off the payment for those organs. We have to stop CCP that dominating, that, you know, this is innocent people's organs that we really have to stop it. But I am just so frustrated. We've been known this issue for the last 30 years. And we really have to do something more than just the hearing here. But the whole world, we have to work together to stop this horrific things. The movement to oppose the Chinese regime's forced organ harvesting continues as more doctors and politicians step up to oppose these crimes against humanity. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. Researchers are calling on U.S. authorities to curb the flow of Western transplant-related technologies going to China. On Wednesday's hearing, experts pointed to the CCP-sponsored scheme of killing people for organs that could expand further with such aid. For insight, I spoke with Cynthia Sun, a researcher with the Falun Dafa Information Center. 
Cynthia, thanks for joining us. Now, based on your organization's research, what is the scope of this kind of unwitting aiding and abetting of forced organ harvesting in China, and what different forms does it take? I think first you have to understand the structure of the Chinese transplant industry. It is not um, private. It's completely different from what we know in the West. So in China, the Chinese Communist Party systematically runs all of the hospitals, including military hospitals, and police and the court system are actually involved in organ harvesting and, you know, persecuting, sanctioning, um, you know, making sure that all of these prisoners of conscience are detained in a single area and are controlled. And what this creates is a structure where it's completely state controlled and it's completely unethical. And a 2019 report actually found that there was 20 or more global companies that are aiding and abetting. And what that means is China's transplant industry doesn't have enough manpower or enough equipment um, to sustain itself. And so over 90% of the immunosuppressants, the medical equipment, the surgical tools, and the different things needed for transplant, a lot of them are actually imported from overseas. And that's where the West comes in. Cynthia, what about U.S. doctors and medical institutions? Your organization has been sounding the alarm for years about U.S. medical institutions helping to train surgeons who are Chinese nationals from hospitals associated with forced organ harvesting. Yeah, so that's the issue. Again, um, a lot of American transplant centers, a lot of medical complexes don't know the reality of what's going on inside China and they think it's benign. They think it's they follow, you know, the oath and medical procedures in China, but that's not the case. And so where I come from in Texas, um, there's been many reports of doctors um, and patients who've actually heard of people recommending, you know, you know, just go to China, you can get an organ for cheaper, you can book an appointment ahead of time. And things like that really concern uh, my organization and concern other medical experts. Because what that's saying is, you know, you can book someone's death ahead of time. And that's a major sign, um, you know, that should be the, uh, war the warning and the alarm that I everyone needs. Um, to see that this is the reality. Um, organ harvesting is happening in China. And so I think right now the training of Chinese doctors needs to stop unless there's some thorough background check or some sort of reassurance that those doctors are going to be working in an ethical setting in the future. And in your research, you found evidence of systematic medical testing of imprisoned Falun Gong adherents taking place in Chinese detention camps. This is based on your interviews with former detainees. Tell us about your findings. So over the past six months, because of the mounting concerns about organ harvesting, it's been happening over two decades, and yet people still seem to not think that it's ongoing, that it's continued to this day. And so I you know, sent out notices and I interviewed over 20 former detainees um, who've now moved overseas to America, to Australia. And what I found was as early as you know, 2003 and as late as 2018, these people have undergone thorough, repetitive blood testing and organ examinations while they were in detention. And this is completely baffling to the regular person. And I think that's really important because you can't control what Beijing does, but we can control on our side um, how many people become organ tourists and unknowingly participate in this crime. Cynthia, as you mentioned, Utah's law is about to come into effect on May 1st. Now, in light of these recent legislative developments, what is the significance of Wednesday's hearing and its timing? So this week actually marks the one-year anniversary of the federal bills passing in the House. So there is a House Bill 4132, which is the stop Force Oregon Harvesting Act. And like the name says, there will be sanctions against perpetrators involved. Um, you know, there might be fines and potential prison terms for individuals found to be involved in forced organ harvesting, which is 
a great development, but right now um, it's been a year and it's still stuck in the Senate. So I think the hearing today by the CECC really is trying to encourage the Senate to push that forward before the next Congress comes into play. And I hope, I hope by November, this will be able to smoothly pass, get to the president's desk and be signed into law. Cynthia, thank you so much for taking the time speaking with us and sharing your research with us. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Officials in Rochester, New York are warning residents after a body was discovered in a local reservoir. Authorities asked residents to boil their water before lifting the order earlier this morning. That the boil water notice that had been in effect for those serv uh, served by the Highland Park Reservoir has been lifted. Water quality tests ordered by Monroe County Department of Environmental Health have confirmed the safety of the water supply. And I remind folks that we did this as a added level of caution. Um, all the city's tests, we test the water regularly, um, have shown that it was safe, but we had, it to, had to have this extra added uh, layer of protection um, out of an abundance of caution, as we said earlier. The city's water authorities discovered an adult male body in Highland Park Reservoir Tuesday morning. They quickly disconnected the reservoir from the public water supply and warned residents. The mayor said authorities have confirmed the identity of the body. The Rochester resident entered the reservoir area on February 24th. He slid down the side of the reservoir into the water and died. Due to the boil water advisory, Rochester City School District shut down after school activities on Tuesday and canceled classes on Wednesday. Rochester authorities are working to fully drain and clean the reservoir before returning it to service. It will take roughly two months. A manhunt in Idaho is underway. Police are searching for an escaped inmate and his accomplice after an overnight ambush at a hospital that left three correction officers injured. The two men are Skylar Mead and Nicholas Umfenor. Police say the attack happened as correction officers were about to bring Mead back to prison from the hospital. Two officers were allegedly shot and wounded by Umfenor and one by other police. Police say the two men escaped in a gray 2020 Honda Civic with Idaho plates. The pair is considered armed and dangerous. A warrant with a $2 million bond has been issued for the suspected shooter's arrest. The FAA is investigating a hot air balloon accident in Rochester, Minnesota. This state traffic camera shows what happened next to a busy road. Around 7 p.m. local time on Wednesday, the hot air balloon was carrying three people when it crashed into power lines. You can see it spark for a few seconds before it drops to the ground and catches fire. Firefighters say they were able to put out the flames fairly easily. All three people on board the balloon survived with just minor injuries. First responders called it nothing short of a miracle. Up ahead, a House hearing examines the Chinese regime's predatory economic practices. Hear how U.S. officials are trying to counter it and what the biggest concerns are. Officials are advocating to bring back nuclear energy in Europe on a large scale. We'll bring you why they're changing course now when we return. Say goodbye to harsh, bitter coffee and hello to a delicious, smooth brew. With specialty quality beans, expertly roasted in-house, you'll taste the difference with every sip. Fermented with a blend of 50 enzymes, Day's Coffee delivers a rich brew like no other. Made with the highest grade specialty beans available, you're sure to taste the difference. Elevate your morning with Day's Enzyme Fermented Coffee. I go by Jackie. I'm 44 years old. I had three kids at the time and single mother. I was working 60 hours a week. Still couldn't pay the bills. I'd skip meals so that they could eat. It's been hard because one thing falls into place, 10 things fall out of place. You know, I just can't do this alone and, and make it work. One in five children face hunger in America, and food costs are rising. 
but everyone needs nourishing food to thrive, and they can when we work together so our neighbors can feed their families. Call or go online right now to join Feeding America with your gift of just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day. Together, thanks to a nationwide network of food banks, dedicated volunteers, and the monthly support of people like you, we can fill plates with nutritious food for families across America. One day my mother came over to my house and said, there's a meeting at the pantry. I said, okay, and I went. There were some ladies in there. They were from the food bank. They asked several questions. Some of those were about me and my story, but it helped me to open up a little bit. We're getting closer to the day when no one in America faces hunger, but we can't do it without you. Call or go online now. Visit helpfeedingamerica.org and give $19 a month, just 63 cents a day. 98% of donations go directly to help millions of people facing hunger, from coast to coast and in your own community. And when you give by credit card, we'll send you this exclusive Canvas grocery bag to show you are a part of a movement of supporters working together to help end hunger. I have people that I can trust. I have, I have hope. Please call now or make your monthly donation at helpfeedingamerica.org. Working together, we can end hunger in America. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. Lobbyists may soon have to choose between the U.S. and Communist China. Senator Marco Rubio introduced a bill on Wednesday that would put American lobbyists at a crossroads. Rubio's office said many lobbying firms are working on behalf of Chinese companies with ties to the country's army or involved in gross human rights abuses, such as the genocide in China's Xinjiang region. But at the same time, the same lobbying firms are also representing American defense contractors. The bill, dubbed the CCP Lobbying Divestment Act, would prohibit U.S. defense contractors from hiring lobbyists who also represent companies on U.S. sanction lists due to national security concerns. Drones may be next on the list of Chinese goods the U.S. targets. A bipartisan group of lawmakers is asking the Biden administration to impose higher tariffs on Chinese drones and issue incentives to boost domestic manufacturing. In a letter yesterday, lawmakers said nine out of ten commercial drones in the U.S. are made by Chinese companies. It said the current 25 percent additional tariff on Chinese drones is not enough to combat the surge in imports. Lawmakers also raised concerns over drones made by Chinese companies that are shipped from other countries. National security concerns were also mentioned. The letter said there is a risk of U.S. residents' personal data falling into the hands of Chinese military. Congress banned the Pentagon from buying or using drones and components manufactured in China in 2019. And the House Foreign Affairs Committee is examining how to counter communist China on the world stage. In a hearing this morning, government officials discussed empowering American businesses and allies in the face of threats from the Chinese regime. The third example I'd like to note is combating PRC economic coercion, which I know is of interest to this committee. This is one of my highest priorities, and I'm grateful for this committee's leadership on the issue. When partners face coercion, we are willing and we're able to help. I led the effort to support Lithuania almost two years ago, which faced PRC trade-based retaliation for opening a Taiwan office, and I used that case to develop a toolkit to directly support other countries facing PRC coercion. Under Secretary Jose Fernandez, highlighted his team's efforts to confront the Chinese regime's predatory economic practices. He named three areas, vulnerabilities in critical mineral supply chains, global semiconductor value chains, and allies faced with CCP economic coercion. The U.S. Air Force tested a hypersonic cruise missile in the Pacific for the first time. The Air Force says a B-52 bomber, bomber fired a full prototype operational hypersonic missile on Sunday. It flew out of Anderson Air Force Base on the island of Guam.
The weapon consists of a rocket booster motor and the hypersonic glide vehicle, which carries a conventional warhead. It's intended to attack high-value, time-sensitive land-based targets. Hypersonic glide vehicles travel at speeds faster than 4,000 miles per hour, making them difficult to detect and to intercept in time. The U.S. has conducted previous tests off its mainland, but this one was intended to send a clear message to Beijing that Washington remains steadfast in the Pacific. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken is traveling to the Middle East again as the war rages in Gaza. He said a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas is getting closer. I think uh, the, the gaps are, are narrowing and I think an agreement is very much possible. We worked very hard with Qatar, with Egypt uh, and with Israel to put a strong proposal on the table. We did that. Hamas wouldn't accept it. They came back with uh, other uh, requests, other, other demands. The negotiators are working on that right now. But I believe it's very much doable and it's very much necessary. Blinken is on his sixth urgent mission to the Middle East since the war began. He was in Saudi Arabia and met with the Crown Prince yesterday. And today, Blinken is in Cairo and meeting with the Egyptian president. Egypt is one of the key mediators in the ceasefire talks. Blinken will also travel to Israel this week as relations have soured dramatically in recent weeks. The visit comes amid disagreements over Israel's plan to conduct ground operations in the city of Rafah. U.S. and Israeli officials say that Israel has been able to gather a lot of intelligence on Hamas during the war. The intelligence includes details about Hamas's leadership, command and control, and communications. The Israeli military reportedly gathered it from hard drives, cell phones, laptops, and maps seized during their operations in Gaza. They also received help from U.S. electronic eavesdropping. And zooming out, the U.S. has submitted a draft U.N. resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. It's tied to the release of hostages held by Hamas. And today, officials from 36 countries and U.N. agencies are gathering in Cyprus. They are to discussing how to expedite aid to Gaza via sea route launched last week. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu could address Congress soon. House Speaker Mike Johnson says he will extend an invitation after members of his conference encouraged him to do so. While speaking to CNBC, Johnson also revealed he had been invited by Netanyahu to speak about the Neset. His, his predecessor, Kevin McCarthy, addressed the Neset when he was speaker. And now we have some short headlines from Belgium and other European countries. American and European officials today advocating for nuclear energy in Europe. They're meeting at a summit in Brussels seeking to rebuild the European industry after years of gradual decline. Nuclear energy is a low carbon source. The political push to expand nuclear is part of Europe's drive to hit climate targets. White House climate advisor John Podesta spoke on the issue at the summit today. Expansion of nuclear power is critical for uh, tackling the climate crisis that is really beginning to uh, disturb virtually everyone across. The European Union committed to cut net greenhouse gas emissions by over 50% by 2030. This has renewed the interest in nuclear power. Another reason is that Europe wants to find alternatives to Russian gas following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. But the push toward nuclear faces problems such as a lack of investment and cost overruns and delays in recent projects. Europe is moving closer to using Russian money to buy weapons for Ukraine. The Prime Minister of Belgium today welcomed the proposal from the European Union. Around 70% of all Russian assets in the West are held in a Belgian securities depository. Here's what the Prime Minister says about the idea. The proposal and the proceeds themselves, I think it's a sensible way of, uh, of doing it. I think the idea to allocate it predominantly to the purchase of weapons makes total, uh, makes total sense. The EU wants to use the profits from the Russian assets it held in Europe, not the assets themselves. The bloc expects this could bring around $3 billion annually. And in related news, Russia conducted its first attack on Ukraine's capital in six weeks. Moscow allegedly fired 31 missiles at Kyiv today. Officials say air defenses shot down all the incoming missiles, but added that 13 people, including a child, were injured by a falling wreckage. Still to come, the madness begins as the NCAA tournament kicks off today. NTD's Dave Martin joins us to discuss what to watch for. Do you live in one of the happiest cities in America? 
hear which cities made the list and what criteria go hand in hand with happiness. More shortly here on NTD News Today. Just like me are happy every day. And it's all because of generous people like you who support Shriners Hospitals for Children every month. All you have to do is call the number on your screen or go online to loveshriners.org right now with your monthly gift. Because of people like you, Shriners Hospitals for Children is able to make an everyday miracle happen for kids like me. <laughs> Call or go online right now to donate $19 a month or more. We'll send you this adorable Love to the Rescue blanket as a thank you and a reminder of all the smiles you're bringing to kids' faces every day. Will today be the day you send your love to the rescue? When you call the number on your screen right now and give as little as $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you'll be making a life-changing difference for a child, just like Sarah. Your monthly gift today could change your life forever. Because of you. We are happy and we know it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please call or go online right now to give. If operators are busy, please wait patiently or go to lovesrunners.org right away. Are you ready to help your family get prepared for the unexpected? Everyone in? Here we go! Ladybug and Cat Noir know how important it is to be ready. Because you never know when Hawk Moth is going to strike or a disaster will hit. Go, Rose! And you don't need miraculous powers. Just put those planning skills you already have to good use. Know who to call, decide on a safe meeting location, and create an emergency preparedness kit. Make a plan that will help you and your family be ready when emergencies happen. Ready Kids can help. I'm coming to save you! Get started at ready.gov slash kids. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, thank you for joining us. Now, the NCAA basketball tournament already started the last two nights with the, quote, first four games. But the first round began this afternoon already. What, what are these first four games? Yeah, it's almost like they're the, the pre-first round or the play of games. Now, for a quick review, the tournament was expanded to 64 teams only back in 1985. 64 teams, I think, is a very good number because it means every team would play a maximum of six games. If they kept winning, no one gets a bye. So it was 64 teams for a number of years until the Mountain West Conference joined uh, Division I back in 2001. So the NCAA gave that conference an automatic bid as well. Now remember, there's two ways of making the tournament. Either you win your conference's automatic bid by winning the conference tournament, or the tournament committee selects you as an at-large bid based on your whole body of work. Basically the best teams that didn't win their conference tournaments. So anyway, when the Mountain West joined, instead of giving them an automatic bid and then taking away one of the at-large bids, they just expanded the field to 65 teams and they had this little known play-in game for the lowest ranked teams. Now we're up to 68 teams, which means four play-in games are now just referred to as the first four, like you just said. If any of those teams advances all the way, they need seven wins instead of six like everyone else. So I don't think it's very aesthetically pleasing anyway, but that is what the first four is. Okay, well now with the first round starting right now, 
What are some things to watch for or some good matchups? Yeah, already we have Michigan State uh, playing Mississippi State right now. Uh, Duquesne is about to tip off against BYU. But for, for me, the first round or two, it's really about seeing if one of these small schools can pull off the upsets. Now, this tournament really creates these upsets by having every game really on a neutral court. No one gets a home court advantage no matter how good your regular season was. And you can bet any casual fan attending these, uh, these games, they're going to want to see something unusual, like a Fairleigh Dickinson or a St. Peter's pulling off the upset against like Mighty Kentucky or Mighty Purdue. Uh, so they start rooting that way, and it really turns into a road game for some of these bigger schools. Those upsets, though, are always the most memorable games. None of those big schools, of course, wants to be the next victim. All right, yeah, looking forward to March Bendis. So, Dave, um, in baseball this morning, the Los Angeles Dodgers' new $325 million Japanese pitcher made his debut, but it didn't go as planned. What happened? Yeah, that is Yoshinobu Yamamoto, and that $325 million, that is the most ever given to a pitcher, and he'd never even pitched in the major leagues before. It was pretty risky. Anyway, he did not have a very good outing. He lasted just one inning, gave up five runs. He really didn't do that well in spring training either. Of course, it's going to be adjustment going from Japanese baseball to the major leagues here. I think it also could be nerves. I mean, that's a lot to live up to, the biggest contract ever for a pitcher who never even pitched here before. Now, I've seen some Japanese players struggle to adjust here, while others like Shohei Otani, they, they thrive here instead. But of course, it's only one game. Now, this Dodgers-Padres series, it's the only regular season baseball games going on right now, and they're playing in Korea. So everything is kind of magnified. But in any case, Yamamoto's Dodgers ended up losing 15 to 11. Well, he's got a few more chances anyway to prove himself, I he's think. He's got so. a few more. That's exactly <laughs> right, Steph. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, great to speak with you as always, Dave. Thank you, guys. And next up, the optimism of spring is spreading across the country. In line with those sunny thoughts, NTD's Daniel Monahan brings us a look at the just-released 10 Happiest Cities in the U.S. published by WalletHub. 182 of the largest cities in the country faced off against each other in three categories, emotional and physical well-being, income and employment, and community and environment. Subcategories include sports participation, life expectancy, the poverty rate, the divorce rate, great weather, and more. So without further ado, here they are, the happiest places in America, according to the research. Number 10 is Scottsdale, Arizona, known for its championship golf courses. Number 9, Columbia, Maryland, located between D.C. and Baltimore. Number 8 is Pearl City, Hawaii, named after the pearl-bearing oysters that were once found abundantly in its harbor. Number 7 is San Francisco, California. Hawaii strikes again at number 6 with Honolulu. Number 5 is Irvine, California, known for its parks and open spaces. Number four is Madison, Wisconsin, famous for its craft beer and cultural events. At number three is San Jose, California. Number two is Overland Park, Kansas, with the highest level of sports participation in the country and the lowest poverty rate. And now the moment you've been waiting for, the happiest place to live in America, in at number one, is Fremont, California where 80% of the households have an income over $75,000 a year. Regardless of where you live, the person who has the biggest influence on how happy you are is most likely you. And research shows social relations may be the most important factor. So here's to bringing positivity in your own home. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. The United States and some large Western European countries are dropping in a global well-being index. Nordic nations, on the other hand, are keeping their grip on the top rankings. NCD's Andrew Thomas has more on rising unhappiness among younger people here in the U.S. The annual World Happiness Report is based on data from U.S. market research company Gallup. The University of Oxford leads a global team to analyze the numbers. The United States dropped out of the top 20 for the first time, falling to 23rd place from 15th last year. Spring breakers in Miami Beach helped explain why. Um, no, I've definitely seen people that have been happier than me for sure. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, that goes on different in their lives and everything. And we go through different solutions and like all this and like 
all the time. I think because of how expensive it, it is to live now, and a lot of people depend on like their financial situation to make them happy. Um, and it's it's the struggle when you don't have the financial stability to like live. 24-year-old Ohio resident Jaylana Hart mentioned inflation, but she's doing all right. Well, I think inflation has, you know, made a lot of people struggle more, so that can be true, but I don't know. A lot of people want to come here, so I don't think it's too unhappy. That's how I look at it. A global happiness ranking for ages 60 and over would put the United States in 10th place, but life evaluations from those under 30 alone put the United States in 62nd. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Want to propose, but unsure if she'll say yes? Increase your odds with this. Christie's is auctioning off a rare 17 carat diamond ring. It's got the highest possible ratings for clarity and transparency. This pear cut rock also has a D color rating, which means it's completely colorless. And it even comes with a custom happy Winston navy blue case. Set in platinum, Christie's is predicting the ring will go for between 700 grand and a cool million. But it's an auction, so you could get lucky. You've only got until Thursday to place an online bid. And that's all for today's news. Thank you for tuning in. For Round the Clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or don't download our NTD app. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world.